Okay, so um, first of all, is everyone having a good time at the, um, the conference so far? Yeah. Learning a lot? Yeah. Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Um, and this is the last session of the day. Your brain is getting to that point of saturation. So hopefully with my energy and um, you know, possibly how fast I speak, you know, that'll, that, that'll get you through the, that, that, that hump. All right. So thank you very much for attending the Business Process Reengineering with SharePoint Workflows. It is the then and the now. Um, COM 105 is part of the community track. Um, and the purpose of the community track um, you know, is, to, is to bring real world experience into, into, into the conference to talk about what's out there, what we've seen, and how that will, you know, how that will relate back into, into your world. If there's lessons learned that you can get from it, and also vice versa, in, in fact, what can I learn from you in terms of what you've seen out there? Um, I like my sessions to be entirely interactive. I don't want, usually I don't want to wait until the end to get questions. As it comes up, you know, let me know. In fact, sometimes my session will take different paths because people are asking questions. I say, is that what everyone wants? Let's go down that path. So, um, so you know, please you know, you know, respond. Let me know what's going on and um, so on and so forth. So who am I? My name is Fabian Williams. I'm a Microsoft Certified Solution Developer, Systems Engineer, Database Administrator. I am not an MVP, but I am an MVS. All right? Everyone here familiar with SharePoint, right? All right, good. Okay, so. I've, I have an MVS. I work with Planet Technologies in the States. We're a national serv um, service solutions provider. Um, we do a lot of Microsoft and the entire stack. I focus on the SharePoint piece of it. And the company email address is there. I do blog. Uh, my blog is sharepointfabian.com slash blog. It is on 20, um, SharePoint 2010 right now. There's this huge conversation that was going on a couple of weeks ago um, um, on Twitter, actually. And um, you know, people are talking about, you know, should we continue with SharePoint 2010 as our blog site? And, and I think, um, uh, yeah, Andrew started off, they're moving back to WordPress, so this is gonna change in like maybe a month or so to WordPress. But you know, there'll be a pointer. My email address is there, um, Fabian at um, you know, Feel free to email me. Um, I usually get back to those questions. Um, you know, where, whereas 140 characters can't do it enough justice on Twitter, so you can send me an email and I will answer it. And the Twitter handle is right there, which is my full name, Fabian Williams. So the warning may come a little bit too late, but it's still there. Um, I speak fast, this is a byproduct of being Jamaican. I, can't help that. Um, but if I do start to see the glazes in the eyes, I will slow down. If you put your hand up, hey, Phil, I will slow down. Um, I will not pie lock you, by the way. Um, you know what pie lock means? So um, there will be demos inside there. Spoost sp sp out just to you know, make sure that you can, you know, everyone's alive. And um, as I mentioned before, this is not a code session, but I will be breaking out Visual Studio um, just to show you um, as a part of the effort. Because again, this is all about what I have done on the project um, for, to, for BPR on a site, and it started out as a Visual Studio solution, and then I built on that moving it forward. So I need to show, at least show you that so you can quantify what the effort is. So this is gonna be our agenda. Um, we're gonna review the project flowchart. Um, we're gonna stop and talk about the requirements and the solution. Um, we're gonna look at what the 2010 approach is. I'm gonna show you a little bit of a demo in terms of what I built out for that approach. And then I'm going to talk about why we went to K2. In fact, you saw me um, you know, point at the gentleman right here. He has a K2 on his shirt. I know he works at K2. So he, he knows he's going to get a little bit of a hit, but it is a good solution. It's a good product. I like it. Um, and then I'm going to do a demo on that K2 piece of it as well. Then I'm going to talk about um, the SharePoint 2013 and an Office 365 approach and then a de demo on that as well. So it's going to be the same solution. And you, you, the benefit you're going to see is that you, we, we started a coded solution and we're ending back at something which you can term as out of box. And you may say, wait a minute, that seems contrary to best practice because best practice always says, what? Start off out of the box, then tweak, and then when you can't tweak anymore, go custom. Which I did try, but the only reason why we're here in the 2013 is because you could not do it. You could not do it out of the box until 2013. All right. So let's start off with a review of the flow, the flow chart, and I am going to leave this up here while I talk about what the project is. So you can study this and listen to me at the same time. So the project is actually with um, a federal agency back in the States, and um, it is uh, it, it's for, the, for the processing of grants, right? So it's committed dollars. You know, Congress awarded these dollars to be given away to interested parties, and um, the, the Right now, or before, they were using um, paper document, filling it out, emailing it from person A to person B to person C, and then um, running it through you know, signatures, 
back and forth, back and forth, and then eventually it would come to an agreement and then boom, it's done. So they wanted to take that process, which sometimes took, I think they said the longest one took like around four months, shortest one takes two weeks, and they wanted to streamline that process. So they provided me with a, a flow chart when I went in, and the flow chart, they said, okay, here's our process. It, it didn't look like this, by the way. This is my flow chart. It didn't look like this. So I looked at the flow chart and I said, okay, fine. Let's walk through, you know, let's visualize it, put it on the board, let's walk through it. And we went maybe around three, four steps into it and they said, well, no, we do it this way. No, we do it that way. So the flow chart that they gave me was not even representative of what their actual process was, which is not, it's not unfamiliar. But, but I will usually use that just to set a baseline with, with, with them and me as an understanding, hey, you know, we need to have something that we're going to agree on. This is what you're telling me that you, is your process, but we already understand that it is not. Which sometimes is a good thing because you, you want the truth. You don't want what they tell you, you want the truth. And maybe they have refined it because it works better that way. So, and which is always helpful to me because I don't want to build against a flow chart and they already have a process that would make it a lot better because then I'm actually taking them back, all right? So after looking at their flow chart and having had a couple of JAD sessions with them, we came up with this, right? So as you can tell here, there's a couple um, spots where you have um, uh, some notepads that'll take you all the way back. So it's not, it, it's not necessarily a sequential workflow as much as it is um, a, state, a state machine workflow if you're thinking in terms of workflow technologies. Or there are iterative nodes. So there's a node that can take you here, then you can go forward and then it can loop you back here, and, um, and so on and so forth. And you'll notice it's called workflow 1A. That is because part of the process um, you know, involved uh, uh, um, where you have nodes that could take it multiple notepads. And this one here, um, I termed Workflow 1B, um, acronym WF1B. And this represents um, another piece of the process, but this was more sequential. All right? um, as you can see, you know, everything will just trace one, back once um, and then move forward. You'll also notice that um, you have, um, depending on where you are here, you have back to workflow one, stop and restart workflow two, and end. All right? So I'm just going to talk through this here for a little bit. Um, workflow one, as you can see, there, some of the actors that are in there is that there's a document that's created. Um, the lead contact receives that document. They determine whether or not it needs to, it, it can pass muster and move forward. If it's no, it goes back to the originator. If it's yes, a question is asked, is it ready for, um, if I can use my mouse, no I can't. Um, is, is it ready for um, uh, SAM approval? Um, then it, it, if the SAM needs to comment on it, it will comment on it, it will come back. Does it require any more comments? No, move forward. Assistant secretary gets it. Is it okay? If no, move it back over here, send it through there. If yes, move it down. The lead submits um, the document to SRD for clearance. And at this point, what's happening is that um, as a part, in this process, this is where an unknown amount of people will be in, included in this workflow process. So it goes through you know, some approval with, real, with actors that are named. Then there are going to be actors that they don't know until that moment in time. And these actors are um, subject matter experts. All right? So we don't know who, who, who we need to approve it, but we know it's going to be a bunch of people. And um, there's, and there's no telling how much that amount can be. I think I've seen it where it's actually 30 people before. And here's a kicker. Um, they all need to approve it to move it forward. It's not based on a percentage. It's not, it, 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 they can't all say no, by the way. Remember, my initial statement was this is committed dollars. You must use it. So they have to all come back to a yes. And the workflow will continue until they come back to a yes or an escalation happens and somebody overrides them. But in the end, it must be a yes. All right? So once, once those people are identified, as it says right here, an unknown amount of approval, it go, if they say no, then it actually goes down this path. Then there's a, a, the, uh, an option to expedite it. If it's not expedited, it begins the other workflow. If it is expedited, it restarts this piece until they get to that yes. Once they get to that yes, then it goes through this process until it ends. All right? Does everyone understand that? We're all on board? Good to go. All right? So let's talk a little bit about um, the, 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 the solution. So as I mentioned before, all process much, must adjudicate to a successful outcome. At the SRD steps, um, whilst the workflow is running, um, there's an unknown amount of actors. The reason why I say while the workflow is running is because if I I'm, if I'm was designing this and I knew ahead of time uh, it was a finite amount, I could build that into the design. 
I can't if I, I don't know. It, it, needs to, it needs to grow or shrink to the amount of people that there is, and I need to be able to manipulate that loop process so that I can always count and say, okay, there's 10 people this time, loop through them, all these 10 people, give them all tasks. Do I have 10 yeses? Okay, I'm good to go move forward. If I don't have 10 yeses, keep waiting, all right? So th that's just the logic pr process that I'm going through. And parallel approvers are allowed to be rejected two times before escalation. So remember I said they all need to be a yes. So for me, I told them, listen, I will go through two iterations. After two iterations, somebody needs to escalate this, somebody needs to answer this. The reason being, I said, is it'll get unwieldy. So we need the cutoff point, so we came to an agreement on that. That was actually my, me interjecting something inside their process. So at this point in time, I want to challenge the audience here. How many people by show of hands think that, think, and by the way, this was back in um, November of, um, what is it, 13? November of um, 20, 2011. And they're, 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 we're working on SharePoint 2010 on-prem. So these are our, um, this is our platform. I tell you this because I'm about to ask you a few questions. How many people here think that we can do what I've just said out of the box, either with the browser workflows? Show of hands. Out of the box? How? How could you do it? <clears throat> All right. The challenges that you're going to face is how are you going to manage parallel approvals and how are you going to manage loops? Which version? 2010? All right. How? I'm sorry? Thank you. That's, I know you can. All right. So to meet all the requirements I've just specified, whereas you, there's an unknown amount of people that you need to give parallel tasks to, I use those words because I knew that I, I will come back at this question. Because I've tried what you're saying. And you, even loops, you can do loops if you use another list, right? But that right there also is, it, 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 because it's based on a timer service, it will miss. It will, it, it will never do the same thing twice. So I've tried that. So how many people, again, think that this can be done? I'm leading you down this road, right? How many people think it can be done out of the box? All right. How many people think that with add-ins you could do this? And by add-ins, I mean um, custom work. You believe we can do custom workflow activities? Yep. All right. All right, so with customer flow activities, how would you meet some of the challenges that, that, that I mentioned before? What would you do? Well, I would actually use one of the competitors that we over Okay, okay, no, but that's a third-party solution, though. I said just add it. So but by add-ins, I mean can you extend SharePoint Designer with a custom workflow activity to do that? All right. So does anyone here, uh, do you know what I mean by custom workflow activity within SharePoint Designer? All right. Anyone not know it? All right, so let's talk about that. So, uh, um, so custom workflow activities um, is basically the ability to create, it's an XML file, you build it in Visual Studio, and you build an action, the same action that you do when you, get, when you click on the, in the tab inside um, SharePoint Designer. You can write modules that will interject that code inside SharePoint Designer, and you can use that as an activity inside SharePoint Designer. There are a couple of things around that, though, is that um, it, it, it's, you can't send emails with it which is when um, the question came over here and somebody said, that, yes, you could. You, if you're going to assign a task, what do you need? You need an email to do that. So that will, you, you, you'll be able to do some of it, but not all of it. So, go ahead. Would it be possible to do it with JavaScript? With JavaScript? Um, yeah, you could do it with JavaScript, but then you know, you're writing client-side code and stuff like that. You say you're still writing, you're still writing code, all right? I, and, and I agree, there's a chance to do JavaScript. Um, he, he's probably doing this because he follows me on Twitter. We do know each other, and he knows I hate JavaScript. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just becoming a, a fan of JavaScript because now I have to because I'm doing 2013. So and he's, he's probably seen me reading the books and talking about all my frustration learning JavaScript because it's not managed code. And if you can't tell, I'm a C-sharp snob. So you know, I'm working through that process. So, um, so what are we left with? It, what are we left with is a solution. And if you walk through those processes, now you know, we tried out of the box. We've tried, let's extend the product via add-ins. Now, custom code solution. So that's what, that's what I was left up with in terms of where we would take this, and the client agreed. All right? They said, yep, go ahead and do this. All right? So some of the design elements, once we came up with that solution, was um, I, as, a, as, a, as a developer, whenever I build solutions, I always think about who's going to see this after I made my first release, or after I made my who's going to inherit this? Because I don't want that person berating me afterwards and saying, oh, look at what this guy did. You know, are you serious? So I usually build it as if I'm going to be the person that's going to come back in afterwards. And to that end, I, and also as a deployment strategy, I, I always build my own fields, my own content types, and my old list definitions. Does anyone not know what those are? 
All right. So, uh, so the, 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 field, the field types gives me control about what you're going to see when you open up your SharePoint list or library. The content type, I know what their process was. You know, they had a paper document that reflected what they collected as a part of that approval process. So I made that into a content type. And my list def is good. Now, all of this information is going to live, in, live inside a document library. Right? So I wanted to control all of these infrastructure components because if I do it on my machine and I code it that way, you know what assurances I have? In their environment, it will absolutely work. Because if it works in my environment and I code it, it will work in theirs. The challenge that some people do is that they will build things out because it's easier you know, inside their environment. And then they will hand it, which works, by the way. If you do that and then back up your solution and then restore it on their environment, it will work, right? Because it's, it's this exact duplicate. But that is not really a good deployment strategy. If you try to redo your efforts over there, it, that I guarantee you will not work. Because the GUIDs, which is everything ties back down to in SharePoint for, for everything that you're doing, will be different. And there will be pieces in here where, where I'll show you where you know, I, I am dependent on a GUID being the same thing. So the first thing I do is create my site columns, content types, and my list definitions for my solution. The next challenge that I faced, which even though you heard me talk about the challenges in terms of um, how would I um, manage the, uh, the parallel approval process, um, which is also a challenge in K2, by the way, um, inside my solution, is that Visual Studio provides you with a couple of things um, called a replicator activity. And you can also create another, I would still need a custom activity. So in the end, I needed a custom activity, and I need a replicator activity to make this work. What those features are is the custom activity, I wanted to bring something down to a unit of work. And that unit of work, you'll see later on, is a task. I want to be able to create a task. I want to assign you a task. And I want to watch that task until it either approves or rejects. And then I want to clean up in the end. So you, the, the, it's task created, on, on task change, and task complete in terms of objects, right? So um, I created a custom activity that did that. And the reason why I did it is because I wanted to be able to use that piece over and over again. And by creating it as a custom activity, I have an assurance that it will do the same thing all the time. The replicator activity I needed because I wanted to be able to say, how many people do we have? Ten? Replicate it ten times. So that's, that was my assurance for that as well. And with a combination of state machine and sequential workflows, we got the job done. So what I'm going to show you now, I'm going to jump out of this for a little bit. Hopefully my warm-up script work, and we are good to go. Uh, this is, this is, I don't like the resolution, but there's not much I can do about that, guys. Um, let me open this up here. I'll go to full screen where I can, and I will talk through it. Okay, luckily, we're not in, doing a code session, so this is just for the benefit of you understanding the pains and perils that developers go through. In the meantime, any questions? Everyone's on board so far? Everyone is in agreement with everything I've said? That's, really? I have a room full of people that agree. You're better than my client. Uh, I'm sorry? Is all it is? It's after 4 o'clock. It's after 4 o'clock? All right. So I'm waiting for this to finish, and then I will jump into that. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. But what you're going to see, I'll talk through it. Um, there's, there's a file that's going to be called, um, a, a, it's an it's a XML file that defines all of the fields. And the reason I'm showing you this is because I want to call out the nomenclature within the fields and some of the things that I need within those fields. Then the next thing I want to show you after that is um, the, the list definition that, that, that I created and the content type that I created. All right. So go away. Go away. All right. So let me bring this down here. All right. So some of the things that we're working with here, um, this is my content fields that you're looking at right here. And, and in the end, it'll make sense. In fact, let me open up the browser right real quickly so that, that we won't have to wait on that. Um, what you'll see when I go into the UI is that you'll see that those fields that I'm defining are used inside the UI. And I'll just move, minimize that in the meantime. So, um, so as a part of the process, again, when you're interviewing and you're doing JAD sessions, you're looking at these forms, and these are asset forms. And you're saying, OK, fine. You're asking for this question. This will become a field. You're asking for that question. That will become a field. This field may be um, a, uh, a choice field with, with answers that you're going to pick from. It may be a single line of text field because it needs you to supply some stuff. Maybe a date field. It may also be a, um, in most cases for, for here, it's a person field mm -hmm. because I am assigning these people tasks. So it's who you are, what you're doing, what information you're collecting, 
right? So the pain here is that it's a, you know, whoever, whoever who in this room has ever had the, the joy of doing this before? All right, a few of you guys, right? So you, you, know, you know you have to be precise in this writing, right? Because you know, it, it, it's unforgiving. You spell something wrong, you, um, you, you, you copy good and you chop off something and you wonder why it's not working because, so there's a lot of things that happen in this process that affects the development the, um, process. You have to, it's meticulous. It's not necessarily hard, it's tedious and meticulous work. And you have to do that for as many as they gave me, which was quite a lot when you see. So this entire file defines that structure for, for all of the different fields that I had to um, come up with and, uh, and build out. Once we've done that, the next thing that I did um, was to come up with uh, my content type. And the content type is a little bit easier because all you're doing there basically is, um, double click, is you're basically, Oh, I'm at the bottom. Thank you. Didn't hear what you said. There you go. So thank you. It's a good catch. Um, so basically, you're basically pulling the fields that you need inside your content type, giving it a name, and then pushing it out the door and telling what the content type is based on. All right. So this is a little bit easier. A lot of the heavy lifting is done inside your field definitions. All right. So I promise you that I wouldn't PowerPoint it. I'm sorry. Um, kill you with code. The last final thing is my list definition, which is built out here somewhere. Uh, there it is right here, my list definition right here. And that list basically absorbs the content type, which absorbs the field, so you can see how that, that's put together, right? So that's what you do in terms of Visual Studio, and when you're done, you basically have features that you deploy as WSPs to, your, to the environment, and boom, you have that solution available, all right? So, so I did that, and in the end, you had a solution, uh, you had a solution that looks a little bit like this, actually. All right, so here's, the, um, here's the, the, the field that wants you to activate your solution. And if I come inside here and I click on, yeah, that warm-up script is really working, isn't it? And I click on Documents, and I go to New Document Set. Because um, the one, another thing is that I wanted to be able to organize this information and um, it was easier to organize it in a document set because I, it's one bucket with a bunch of metadata and you can put anything that you want inside there. So as you can see, those fields came out inside here quite nicely. Some of them are required fields, as you can tell. The drop down, the, um, the choice fields, and a bunch of people fields. So as you can see, a lot of it is people fields. In this instance, um, remember that question about is it ready for the, the review? Some yes, no fields inside there. Um, and also you know, some date fields inside there and so on and so forth. So that's basically the UI. And once you do that, I'm actually going to show you what one looks like full. So these are a couple of testing that I was doing right here. You can see you know, the Alpha Bravo Charlie stuff. If you can't tell, I already have a military background, so a military background. So I use a lot of that nomenclature in time my testing. So that's where we are for, um, for Visual Studio, and that's what had to be done. Indeed, I'll, I'll actually start um, say that. As, as this process moved along and I needed to move it into K2 and eventually um, SharePoint, SharePoint um, Designer, that work that was done already actually benefits us because I can actually say, okay, drop the WSP there and then I can now use a K2 to say, attach to this library and start doing your work. Or in SharePoint Designer, you create a list, a workflow based off this or this library and move it forward. Again, reuse of work is always something that you want to do and by creating that environment, um, in code allows me to do that. All right. So let's talk about uh, the, the SharePoint 2010 approach. So you already saw the UI, you saw the content type, you saw the list definition. The next thing that I needed to do was create my state machine workflow as necessary uh, for the necessary stages. So uh, again, you're boxing your things around it. So um, it needs to have, what needs, we need to assign a task here. Who does it go to? This person needs to approve or reject it. What happens when they reject it? It goes back here. What happens when you approve it? It goes here. So you start to look at things in that, in that approach and see how many rejection points there are. And if there are rejection points that point all the way back, if it's not you know, a sequential path, then you have a decision that you've made where this can't be sequential. It must be state machine. Um, create my custom activity. I already talked to you about that for the parallel approval and sequential process. Incorporate the, um, the custom activity inside the sequential process. Code the workflow activities and the methods, and custom methods, and test, test, and more tests. Um, the custom methods that were needed inside here are, are a couple fold. Um, one of the methods that I, ne I needed to build as a part of this process was the counter, right? I need to figure out how much people do we have inside, inside of the parallel approval process. 
so I can know um, how many times, uh, how many replicator tasks I need, as well as um, how many people have not yet approved this instance of this workflow. So I can know, do I need to keep the loop running? All right. So those are some of the custom methods. Another custom method I needed was um, I needed to do escalation steps and other notifications that are not part of the task. So you, you know, we use SP, um, SP SendMail utility, which is a .NET um, uh, utility inside, inside um, SharePoint that you can send out custom emails as well. All right. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Okay. So let's drop out and come back inside here. Open this up. And while that's going on, actually, before I do that, let me at least get K2 Studio started because I'm going to come there next. And um, so, so, once, so once we've done all of this heavy lifting and we have those, um, those uh, WSPs built out, then remember we saw Workflow 1 and Workflow 1B, right? So Workflow 1, we know, as I mentioned before, it's going to be a state machine workflow. How many people here have coded a state machine workflow before? Or at least been in a project where one's been used? OK, a few, all right. So, so it's just a different template, and it, um, it, it builds out as, as such. It follows the logic that you saw from, um, from, the, uh, from, from the flow chart, um, you know, albeit in different, different um, naming schemes. But um, you have your, your activities and your task inside there. It follows all the way through. Remember, does it need approval? Um, goes over to the assistant secretary approval. If it's rejected, move back here. If it's forward, move there. And it, all, it goes all the way down until it ends right there, the state finish. Now, what I'm doing at this process also, I'm actually setting a flag that says, you know, um, workflow one ended. And I'm looking in for work, in the second workflow I have, workflow one B, checks to see what that flag is so it knows to kick off. So once that's done, um, in fact, I want to jump and show you something. This is my custom activity. All right. So I built a custom activity that you'll see in the next workflow. And this is what all the activity does, as I mentioned before. I wanted a unit of work that I could use over and over again, and I can just call that unit of work. So create a task, look at the task to see when it's changed. This is basically a while loop, looking to see is it 100% you know, is it, um, complete or not, and whether it's approved or not for it to move forward. What I want to show you, however, is the some of the dependencies that I had inside there. So I'm actually going to view code just to show you. And you should always challenge your consultants, by the way, and, and your speakers. You know, we tell you stuff, and you just automatically believe it. You should say, hold your feet to the fire. But as you can see right here, um, you know, the, the GUID is presented. So the task field. In fact, um, a part of this process, a part of the design, is that uh, um, whenever you create a, um, a task as a part of a workflow, you know it actually adds the item to the task list, right? Yes? Not if you're with me, right? Yeah? Because it, it needs to track that task. So SharePoint already has this task list. And, and when SharePoint installs, the task is created, that GUID is always going to be that GUID. Does everyone agree, agree with that statement, right? Yes? All right. So I, I know I was able to call that one. However, I need another field. So, I be, so here, when I did my custom field definitions before, that GUID right there is the one that I created. And this one I said I have a dependency of that GUID, which is, again, further reasoning why I need that. As well, um, other things down there that I'm looking at, um, I'm looking inside here to find out, set the redo fields, all right? So I'm looking to see how many people approved versus how many people rejected. For everybody that's rejected, I'm taking them out and I'm moving them into a redo field. Then I'm looking at that field and I'm setting new task again and I'm, that's, my, that's my logic to go forward and forward and forward. Again, I'm not here to teach you code, I'm here to show you the logic and the effort that's required on a custom solution. And it's actually a good setup for him because what his product does, K2, you don't have to do any of this. All right? So, and it works really well. So, um, so, so this, this all works through the process. And um, in the end, you have a workflow that, um, that, that gives you that, uh, oh, no, I did not show you the state machine one. Sorry, the sequential one. So th those custom activities are incorporated inside workflow two. 1B, in fact. And basically, let me just go full screen on this one. Full screen. All right, so basically, you have these 
you'll, you, you'll notice that there's locks on these right here. The reason that there's a lock is because it's a custom activity embedded inside my workflow. I cannot edit it here, but I can certainly use it here. So I'm using this, this custom activity, and um, it's, it's, it's also wrapped inside the replicate task. You want to see that? So that's, I, I said, okay, how many, what's the counter? Take this, blow it out, and then ask these people questions and so on and so forth. All right? And that goes all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down to the very end right there, all right? So it's an involved process, right? And this involved process takes time. In the end, it took me, I think, four and a half weeks to build this out, but that's also going back to the well and saying, is this what you want? No, it's what I want. Or I met into an issue and I said, you know, I need clarification on this. So it's not like it was four weeks of just hunkering over the computer doing it, but that's the process that was required to do that, all right? So with that, let me jump out of full screen. I'm sorry? Right, so, so you wouldn't be debugging it on the prod machine because you, know, you, you certainly can't do that, but, um, but I, I didn't have any issues debugging in my world because um, you could set breakpoints inside here and then, and then start the process. And in fact, that's how I tested to make sure it worked. I actually you know, de set the debugger and um, put, a process, put something in the hopper and watch and break it and set the breakpoint and watch it walk through just to make sure it was managing my variables. And I, I met into issues with my replicate activity. I met into issues with my um, GUIDs because I, that was my part. I didn't do it right, and I was able to fix those. Um, but it, it was, in the end, it wasn't a technical challenge. It was more <laughs> developer error. You know, that's what unit testing is for, right? All right. How many uh, mm -hmm. requests did you get? From the client? Yeah. Um, a couple of changes. So um, there, there were... Oh, how many, um, oh, you mean quantify the amount of um, items going through? So um, you're talking for load testing then, right? So I, I, I uh, on a normal, it's not normal, so I shouldn't use the word normal, and I can't give away the client, even though you probably can see some of the names inside the code, but I can't say it out loud. Um, but um, but uh, it's cyclical, it's cyclical. So there's a time of year where it just gets heavy, where they're getting like hundreds of transactions a day. And then there's a period of time when there's none, actually zero, because um, the people who are using it are not there for, to use it. All right? It's a very cryptic answer. I can give you a better answer when you're one-on-one, -on -one, but not on tape. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so let me at least open this up and then start talking about the K2 piece. All right? <coughs> and then I will jump back inside here and from current slide. All right, let me see how I'm at time. All right, we're still, we're still good. All right, so let's talk about the K2 approach. So, and I'll tell you the story behind it. It's a funny story um, if, you, if, you are, if, you're, if you're a masochist and you like pain. So after doing all of this work in, in, in Visual Studio and the client loved it, they said, yeah, it tested well, we love it, great work, great job. They said, guess what, the, 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 it's a federal agency. The, 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 the agency that sits on top of this agency purchased software from a vendor and said that thou shalt use this software in everything that you do. No custom solutions because we want to be able to, when you as the contractor leave our facilities, leave our building, we want to be able to take charge of this and move it forward without having to bring you back in, which is reasonable. It is reasonable, and I agree with that, right? But I wish I would knew that up front, all right? Um, so, so, so they said, okay, stop what you're doing. And by the way, up, up on this, and this is to a credit to, to their software, up until that time, I've never even seen K2 before. Never even seen it. And, and they said, you need to build it in K2. So I said, you know what, I need training. So we actually paused the project and for two weeks, two weeks actually, I went to training. And the training actually was for, it's a four day training, but I needed the rest of the time to do proof of concepts for myself so I can say, yeah, you know, I know how to do it. And luckily, the person who was my trainer is also a fellow speaker, his name is Chris Geyer, and to his credit, you know, plug Chris. Um, but, um, but he did a great job and I was able to, take my logic as a part of our training course, I was, you know, even though he's doing his scripted training which goes through their own stuff, I, in my back I was actually trying my own stuff, you know, as my lab. I wasn't doing his lab, I was doing my lab to make sure it works. And uh, in the end, in, in, in the end of four days, I knew enough that I was able to navigate their tool, understand the objects and things inside their tool, and have, and have a, a, a basic, well, I wouldn't say basic, I had a, I had a proficiency in getting stuff done. Some of the challenges, however, was how do I still do that parallel approval, which um, is it, tricky, but let's go down this process. So 
um, create the SharePoint integration workflow activity. So there's a, there's, a, there's a couple different ways that you can do K2. You can do K2 based on events. You can do K2 based on SharePoint integration. You can do it. In fact, K2 gives you so many different ways, even your own ways of, of, of adopting things. And so I had the SharePoint integration activity, the events, other event activities such as email activities. Sometimes it's a document library activity. So I want you to look at the document library and see if this changed, then do this. And I also came up to something that was called a smart object. And a smart object is a good and a bad thing. All right? It's a good thing because a smart object can be anything. All right? It ties to any data source. You can give it your own fields. You can write logic against it. It is really, really open. And, and, uh, and you, can call, you can write a lot. You can use it. It's really good. Let's, let's take it from that point. The, pro the challenge with it is that it doesn't deploy well between environments. That's one challenge with it. In the version I had, you can challenge me on that, all right, in, 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 in the lightning rounds. <laughs> so say, uh, that's why I have this. I call this on save and export to K2. And remember the version that I'm on, too. So Which version? Um, one point six point something or another. I, I'll, I'll show it to you. It's, it's, it's here in the end. I'll go to help and about. Now, the one thing I like about K2 is that even in 2010, they had the fantastic vision, or maybe even before, of separating the workflow engine from SharePoint, which is what 2013 does, right? Which is a brilliant idea, right? Because you want to take that unit of work out, run it over here so it doesn't affect the farm. And, in, and indeed, you can use more functionality from Windows Workflow Foundations, which is you know, the basis of all of this, that you can't do when it's coupled to SharePoint. So I wanted to call that out. And the, I have this here because of the version I was using at the time. I had to figure out a way to package and deploy the solution and get it across, all right? And um, as I mentioned right here. Time. That's my qualifier. So let's look at K2. Again, so we've, we've seen the solution so far in Visual Studio. Now we're going to see this inside K2. All right. So let me move this over a little bit. So here's my actual, my, um, my smart object called a parallel approval response. And it's basically capturing the process ID, the current user. Let me move this over here. Um, the current user response and the redo pass. So who it is, who has it, um, how many people there are, did they say yes or did they say no, and where am I in my redo? Am I redo one or redo two? All right? So all the same questions I was asking inside my coded solution. And uh, let's open this up here. <coughs> and we will take a look at, this, at the solution. Now, while that's coming up, I will tell you that you know, there is... Um, no code was, was written, or, or I mean no code, I mean no, nothing that had to be compiled in K2. I did have to chain together logic. I did have to create a smart object. They do have um, processes inside there that you can do, um, you know, you know, if then conditional statements and, you know, and all of that good stuff. But you're basically just doing wizards, you know, this is equal to this, so on and so forth. So it's really, really easy to do. And, um, and they have a very, very good wizard. I'll, I'll, I'll try and pop open one right now, actually that walks you through the step. So, so as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as a BA, all right, so here's one. This is actually the first one. Is it ready? For, remember the first step? Is it ready to, be, to move down, down, down the hopper? So it comes up here. It has an email already built in. You can customize that email, which is really cool. And you can make use of your metadata fields inside there as well. Um, you can, here's a good part. You can give it output lines. So, so what, are my, what are my actions? which is really cool in K inside K2, which um, gives you the flexibility of having a state machine workflow inside here because you can drag lines wherever you want it to go and it'll take those paths. In fact, you can drag lines, you can drag from one decision to two different places and it will take two separate paths, which you may say, why would you need that? There, you know, there's sometimes a need for that, but I'm just glad that I have the ability to do that without any code, All right? So yes, no, or rework, All right? Then you basically say, these are my outcomes. What's my default outcome? What's my default action? And inside here, um, how do you get this one to open up again? I'll just open it this way. So inside here, let me do it in advanced mode. You can see more stuff. You, um, you basically can tell it how you want it to run. Do I want it to run sequential, all in one line, per slots? And slots are basically units of work. Um, how many slots to create? And um, also, who to assign it to? I was trying to get to that who to assign it to one, which I think I just jumped over. Didn't I? I don't know how to get it. No, I'm not going to. 
I'm sorry? Select the default and select edit. Select the default and then select edit. Next. And then it's here and then edit. Good man. Just because you're in the wrong field. All right. So here I'm identifying the, um, the metadata fields for the people who I want to send stuff to. So all of the wizards are similar to this. And as you can see, and if, as long as you can follow instructions, it's really easy to do. And if you have a BA, um, a business analyst, or a power user, they can, if they have the privileges and the rights, they can use this and really, you, you can take me, a professional developer, out of the way. Right? And you're building it for yourself. So you know, you, you know your process. Because the first thing I need to do when I go into an organization is understand their process. They already know their process. All right? So that's what happens in K2. And inside K2, a couple of things I want to call out as well. Um, let me see, I'm going to do it on time. All right. Oh, wow, coming up to my time. I will say this. When, when, as, a, as, a, as a consumer of this workflow, the way that you can adjudicate it is several different ways. You can actually have emails being sent to you via the task that you're assigned, and you can hit reply and reply back with the responses, and mm. that adjudicates it for you. All right? So that's pretty cool. So you can email response back and, and, and never go into SharePoint. You can also, if you're going to SharePoint, there's um, web parts that they have that you can say, okay, it, it follows all the actions, you know, approve, whatever, whatever. But it also has these built in, which is um, delegate, and there's a couple more. Do you remember them offhand? Redirect. Redirect. Redirect, exactly. And you, as the end user, can do that and send it to somewhere else, and it doesn't interrupt the process of the workflow. Whereas if this was maybe in a, in, in a coded solution, it's this, and, and, and that's it, right? You, you, you can't extend it beyond that unless you build that in. All right, so I know I'm, there's time when someone to actually jump over now and go to um, my um, talk, to, talk to you about now this other approach. Come on, all right. So now, in, so that's where we are right now with the client, by the way. Um, we are test, we're in our, um, we're in our end user testing right now and it is going well and, and they're happy again, all right. But I started working with um, SharePoint um, 2013 and I, on my own, I said, you know what? I wonder if this could be done, all right, in 2013, all right? Yeah, all right? So this is to your point now. Now, um, I, I, I basically opened up 2013, and um, I looked at what was available, which I'm going to talk about later on, and I'm, I said, I'm going to try it. So the first thing I did was stub out my process using the SharePoint Designer stages. Stages are new to SharePoint Designer 2013, and what stages give you is the benefit of state machines, right? Because you can say, move here, then move here, then move there. Um, and use appropriately, it gives real-time status um, in the UI for the status fields. Define the transition steps for the stages, and um, so basically coding the logic to go, to go between that and coming up with the parallel activities. Um, move down, okay. So let me show you how that works. All right. OK. So indeed, actually, I should have done this before. So right. while that's coming up, let me go back to my presentation and do that So from current slides. So when it comes up, I'll show you it in real time. But for now, I'm just going to step through some slides. So. A couple of things is that you have um, the stages give you a name. And if this, this field, which is usually default, set to yes, um, as, you're, as you're looking inside your list, it will give you real-time updates as it's going through the process. So, you're, if, so the default name is stage one, stage two, stage three. But if you give them meaningful names and think about what those stages should look like and use them appropriately, they can represent units of works that will be informative to your end users. All right? Um, so... Couple things. So we talk about stages, and these are your stage names, all right? All right. And then you can also put steps inside those stages to segment that work that work process out. You also have loops inside there, which is pretty cool now. Um, and uh, and 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 because of these new investments in toolings, um, I actually am a, a big fan. In fact, you know, as much as I'm a C sharp snob, I start to do things here as much as possible now, especially because I'm built into the cloud anyway, and I can't do it on prem. So um, everything I do, you know, I try to at least come here first and try it. So um, you know, within, within the transition stages, you can move between those, um, those stages, and that is what represents me now saying, is it approved, and um, where to send it next? And if it's rejected, where to send it next, all right? OK, so let me see if it's up, designer. 
what's it? Oh, I have no internet access. Right, 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 right. So yeah, so we have to talk to it in the abstract. Um, so um, so so I I I, I will blog this. I think I already have the blog. I just need to publish it, and you'll be able to see um, that that uh, what that process looks like. But what I need to do now, because I'm in the interest of time, I need to move a little bit uh, faster. But we're we're very much at the end anyway. Um, so. So then, then, then now I'm just going to skip to this right here. So I, I, I wanted to come up with a matrix to, to, to let you know if you're thinking about this either as a developer or a business, I should have asked this question before, as a business analyst you know, who's in my audience, or as an end user, as a project manager, or so whatever, you know, what, what my opinion, by the way, these are my opinions, and they are, you know, some of them are subjective, some of them are, are objective, um, based on what I'm measuring right here. This is how I came up in terms of Visual Studio K2 solution and SharePoint Designer. And I'm ranking them with, you know, the, here's, you know, run away from it very fast or excellent overall experience, right? There's no ones, obviously. Oh, gosh, don't use that. <laughs> <laughs> don't use that. Um, but, um, you know, I'm ranking SPD 2013 as high because it is not a, it's not a third-party solution. And, and you can always revisit that later on. K2 solution, I put right behind it. And even me, as a C-sharp snob, I even put this here. I, I will tell you that because of all this stuff that I had to go through the pains, compared to the rest. Now, if I didn't have any options, these would all be fives. But because I have an option, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, in comparison to the rest, that one is, you know, I would go with that solution first. Testing time, K2 is much, much better because it allows you with K2 workspace to, you know, to see a big chart about where things are going in real time, right? which, is, which is excellent. SPD, you know, it's based on how you code those things in the back end. Um, development time, I give it to here because of the challenges that I face inside here, and I face no challenges there. Here, a little bit of a challenge, right? Um, change management, in the version that I had, you know, you know I, I give this right here, to, because the one thing I like about K2 is that you can run different instances of the workflow at the same time. Obviously, in SharePoint Designer, you can't do that. When you publish it back, that's now your new version, right? Um, you, you can have other versions out there, but once it, once it um, uh, see where the music for um, Kiesk, it's gone. Um, end user experience, good here because of the web parts. Good here because of the workspace. Here is based on what you build. Here, again, what you build. And client friendly, I tend to go with this one, but they're all low marks, as you can see right there. So this is my, t sorry, go ahead. All right, I, would, uh, I don't know what the client paid for K2, but because it's a federal agency, I would guarantee that it was a very good price to them. So I'm sure it probably came in, in, in if you're looking at it you know, with sunken costs and everything else, I'm sure this probably wins over this because this is so, uh, it's unreliable to, you know, in comparison to the rest, right? Here, I think if you, if, if you could do it, this would obviously win, right? Because then it's just your own human cost. Um, there's, no, there's, there's no consultancy, there's no third-party product. So, but I think that this, in my, in my example, this won out because it was an enterprise agreement across the organization and we're just fitting in that one home. Now, if they, had they just bought it just for that project, then I would say probably not. All right? So I know I'm running out of time. In fact, my time is probably over. Um, I'll take any questions that you have right now.